also a hobby. I'm in Duke. You can stalk me on the internet, all those places, and I'll tweet out these slides. So you don't need to take notes or anything like that. Um, this talk's called Get Your City Together. So if you're interested in Git in your country or your neighborhood or town, but maybe there's not a Git user group close to you, this talk's going to give you everything you need to do to start a Git user group where you live. Um, and yeah, so I hope it's useful for you. So what you're going to learn is how to bootstrap, how to get the resources you need, like venue space or people to, you know, companies to donate food so people actually show up or all those little things that make meetings really happen where people want to hang out and they have internet and they have some pizza to eat and things like that. And also how to be sustainable as a user group because that actually is the hard part. It's very easy to start a user group and have one meeting. It's a lot more challenging to have a user group and keep having meetings every month. So uh, a little, some tips I've learned and I've definitely had you know, failures in the past as well, and you learn from them. So some of my failures will hopefully be your, your learning points. Um, so my origin story is I started PDX Git. PDX is the airport code for Portland, Oregon. So that's like our nickname for our city. I was realized that that didn't, some people didn't know that. So Portland, Oregon is where I live. And I started the first Git user group because I saw that my town didn't have a Git user group, so I solved that problem. Well, why did I think this was a problem? I went to the Google Summer of Code Mentor Summit in 2010, and kind of randomly, the World Git Developers Conference was just after that. So I went to that, and I met all these amazing Git developers, super smart people that are like a thousand times smarter than me, and I just kind of sat next to them, and I learned a bunch of stuff. I got really excited about Git, and I just you know, wanted to have a Git user group and just thinking about it, but I didn't do much. And then the next year, they also had it right after the Google Summer Code Mentor Summit. They kind of bundled them together so that the thousands of people coming from all over the world, there was a big overlap between Git and the GSOC Summit. Also, Git is a part of GSOC, so it was a nice, it was a cool thing for two years that they did that. And then no more. After 2011, the get together, they had some in Europe, and then kind of it, they didn't have them anymore. They, it, it, it's called something else now. It's in Paris once a year now. So it's not linked up to the Google Summer of Code Mentor Summit, and I was sad about that. So I needed to start a user group in my own city. So it finally got off the ground. February 2012 was the first get get meeting. So that's just kind of the origin story for the, the Git nerds in here and, and where, where this thing came from. Um, so what's the infrastructure? I'm actually going to give you stuff. Like you're going to be able to fork a repo and you're going to have a website for your Git user group in 10 minutes. So what is it? it's GitHub Pages, which if you've not heard of GitHub Pages, it's a very convenient way of having a website inside of a Git repository. And each time you push your changes, it just updates the website magically. You don't need to go into the server and move files around and do all that stuff. So it's just like all those FTP nonsense problems just goes away. You just you edit your Git repository, you push it to GitHub, and then GitHub pages makes the website reflect the repository changes. So it just it's awesome and it, it makes your life way simpler for keeping your website up to date. It uses Twitter Bootstrap. So GitHub Pages is, is that mechanism of, of having your repository hooked up to the website. The actual HTML, CSS, all that stuff is Twitter Bootstrap because that's kind of the standard or was it was the coolest, hottest new thing when I was building this. Now there's there's cooler, hotter things, but it looks cool and it's 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 maintainable. I'm not a front end person actually. I, I I refuse to learn CSS until CSS three or four came out maybe. So, but Twitter Bootstrap makes things really easy for for me. It just I can actually edit the website in CSS, and Twitter Bootstrap makes it easy for a, a non you know someone that's not really a CSS master. Um, font Awesome is a is an iconic font. So if you notice, many many websites on the web now have iconic fonts, and what that means is. No matter what resolution you zoom in or anything, it's it's perfect. It's like a vector graphic instead of 
having an image where an image, if you zoom into it enough, you get the pixelation and all that. So Font Awesome is, open, and this is you know, all open source stuff, you can find Font Awesome is on GitHub as well. And then of course Git. So Git is what ties all these things together, and we've got a cat in a tube to make you guys laugh. <laughs> okay, so kind of the subtitle of this talk would be getting free stuff. How do you get free stuff? Because you're basically just gonna go to various organizations, companies, people, and you're gonna ask them for free stuff. And what do you need? You need a venue, you need somewhere to have your meeting. You need to have food. If you don't have food and drinks, no one's gonna come to your meeting. I'll just tell you. Have something, even if it's some pretzels and water. Just have something, okay? Because then you can say, there's snacks and drinks, even if it's pretzels and water, you know, it's okay. Um, and swag is, you know, that, that slang for just free stuff, like the, you know, USB drives or some kind of, you know, I don't know what they give out today. What do they give out today? T-shirts. T-shirts, USB drives, CDs, you know, all that, all that stuff that, um, that companies kind of want to give out to get their thing out there. They want to give it to you so you can give it out to the people at your meeting. So they, they want to give you free stuff. And the philosophy you should have is, they want to give me free stuff. I just need to know how, who to ask and how to ask to make them want to just throw free stuff at me. Because they, they do. If you ask them the right way, they will bend. They will just think they want to help you. It's, it's, it's fascinating. And the other thing that, you know, you don't have to have publicity. If, if you know everyone that wants to come to your meeting, like if you're five friends, then maybe publicity doesn't matter, right? But it's actually pretty interesting if you do get a little publicity, because then people will come to your meeting that you have no idea. You've never met them. They're from the other side of town. Maybe they're from the other side of your country, or they speak a different language, but somehow it was you know, on some Facebook post or something, and, and they found out about it. So, and that's kind of the whole point of this thing, to bring people together, right? So I do think putting a little bit into publicity, and what that means is just sending it, send an email to a few mailing lists, you know, maybe write a blog post or something, and, and don't try to do it all yourself. You get some help, but, um, this talk really is a lot about getting free stuff, so that's, that's going on. So, <clears throat> I, I had to put this here, because I couldn't find a good meme for this. <laughs> well, this the most interesting slide deck in the world. <laughs> okay, so how do you find sponsors? So in your town, find companies that depend on Git. If you find a company that depends on Git, they will inevitably be hiring all the time people that know Git, so they want you to associate your Git user group with it, their company. They want to give you free stuff. It, it's a, this has worked for me. So companies that want to hire, which I think is the next one. Who's on a hiring frenzy? What company is hiring the most people right now in your city? That's a very good person to go ask for free stuff because Usually that means they just got a funding round, so they have lots of money, they don't know what to do with it, they're just throwing it around and trying to get 10x engineers and whatever. So that's another good kind of avenue. Look for who just got a funding round, and then that's go ask them for money, because they have a lot. Um, now, a different tack is who's the underdog. So there's certain companies that they're not the cool company in town. There's some other company that's the super cool company people want to work for them, well, they have motivation then to get their name out there to say, you know, we're helping the community or we're doing cool stuff. So actually, you know, the funding round people, those are usually the hot, cool new startups, right? So sometimes they're too cool and they don't want to talk to you. You can go the opposite direction. Is who is the underdog? Who is not getting enough publicity in this town and maybe wants to get a little more? Those people will be motivated to help you because you know, you just say thanks to Company X for giving us free pizza, and they are happy, so happy for that, and you get free pizza. So, um, another great thing is find other user groups in your town and ask them who sponsors them, or if they just have recommendations for who might be open to sponsoring you. And really do use that tribal knowledge because every person that runs a user group knows an immense amount of things that they're never going to tell anyone unless someone asks them. Just because they're running around managing, cat herding, doing stuff, as Roland probably knows. And you know, people that run user groups know an immense amount about 
the intersection of technology and social, but you have to ask them because they they don't have time to write a book about it or, <laughs> or tell you. So other user group leaders, uh, introduce yourselves to them and get their advice. That is a, a great thing to do. Um, and specifically for cheap venue spaces, you can't find any companies, libraries, community centers, and universities. You should be able to, hopefully, if you're anywhere close to one of those three things, you should be able to get a free venue space there. Hopefully. Yeah. Speaking of, we put the plug at our venue university. <laughs> plug in the box if you want to charge us nothing with this. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> See? So because we're awesome, free, open source hackers, people want to give us stuff for free because we give them stuff for free. These companies depend on our code, so they're motivated to give you stuff for free. You just say, oh, did you use some of my code or some of my, my project's code? Because like, that's all free, so just give us some pizza or something. <laughs> you know, I'm going to even notice. Um, and then, you know, there's so many Mozillians here. We have a Mozillian track. Go find your local Mozilla office. They are a great place to, for your venue. PDX Git has had some of our meetings at the local Portland, Oregon Mozilla office. So if you have a Mozilla office anywhere close to you, or if there's any Mozilla volunteers or anything like that, go talk to them, and they probably can connect you with resources. Because obviously, Mozilla is dedicated to open web. And if you're having a Git user group, it fits in the, the ecosystem. So they're there to help. All right. Is there any questions on that? I just said a lot of words, I guess, maybe. We're good? No questions. Cool. I presume asking, asking organizations for support is not solely limited to Mozilla in this case, right? No, it's not. I just, there's, all, there's a Mozilla office in a lot of places, and there's a lot of Mozillians here, so that was my uh, thing. But, but if, you know, how many places does Wikipedia have offices? Is there lots of those? There or? are 40, there are chapters in 40. Well, there you go. So there's a lot of Wikipedia offices. I think Josh is, is saying that Wikipedia wants to pay for your Git user group, so you should talk about it. We don't have money yet. Don't try it. If you're in development, this would be really interesting. OK, so here's maybe a little more abstract thing, but I'm a mathematician in my life, so I, I like some abstractions. Self-organizing communities. Git is a self-organizing community, the actual Git core. So the way Git works, they don't use GitHub, okay? That GitHub is not the way Git works. Git is a mailing list, a chaotic mailing list. Thousands of emails per day. And that's how they make it all work somehow. So embrace chaos then. If that's what, that's the core of Git embraces chaos and they somehow make it work. So don't work against chaos if you have a lot of it already. Embrace it, uh, make it work for you. That's the way Git works itself. Another one is Boston meritocracy. That's, I think that's one of my personal values as well. But the people in the meeting that do things, give them authority. Give you know, give them the, the commit rights to update the website. You know, allow them to help you and talk to the venues. And if you try to keep everything yourself and not give people you know the merits that they deserve, then you're not going to have as good of a, a user group as you could. So uh, the people that do stuff, like make sure you recognize them and thank them. And if you have someone that's maybe loud, noisy, squeaky wheel and complains a lot, they don't actually do anything, just ignore them. Like they're ignorable. Like if they're not contributing but they're complaining, they have they're not bringing merit to the group and ask them to contribute and then maybe you'll take their, you know, your complaint a little more seriously. But there's a lot of people that will complain in the world. Much fewer people will give you constructive help. So just ignore the people that are complaining and, and not helping. And then uphold transparency. Yeah. It looks like you're not halfway through. No, it's, it's cool. I can... Okay, I think I did address Brown tonight. Or what's the time? Are we... I, I think you're going to start eating the next slide. Okay. So I'll, hey, carry on. I'll go. I'll go. If you guys want to leave, I will not be offended. It's all good. Call, call transparency. I'll call transparency. So we're in the free and open source world. I think we all believe in transparency. So it's not this topic that is foreign, but really 
make sure that you make decisions as transparently as you can. So if you can, just make everything public on the mailing list. You say like, hey, I talked to this company, they're, they're maybe gonna give us something, but I don't know, and then I talked to this other one. Instead of just keeping it all in your head and then you're the only one that knows it, and maybe some other person is like, oh, why, why aren't they telling me you know, what they're doing? And, you know, the more transparent you are, the less miscommunications there can be, the fewer just potential misunderstandings. So just be more transparent than you even want to. I mean, there's, you know, you're not dealing with national security matters, so just be more transparent if you can, and things will probably be better. So that's my song and dance about uh, transparency. <clears throat> so community guidelines. I'm not going to give you, you know, these are the guidelines, and you should take these guidelines to your community, but these are meta guidelines to create your community guidelines. So define them publicly, put them on your public website, let everyone give input and, and say, I think this is good or this is not. Um, modify them publicly. So if they're on GitHub, you've already got it. You know, basically, be, the system I'm going to give you is going to allow you guys to do all these things. But these are the core concepts. And this, I think, is the most important and hardest. And people are not willing to do it sometimes. But if someone is being a real X that I won't say, you need to enforce your community guidelines in public. Because they were being that bad person in public. So imagine you have a mailing list of 100 people, and one person says a bunch of really mean, nasty things to one other person on the mailing list. And then you, as the moderator, you privately email the bad person all those other people kind of don't see that, and that can cause weirdness. It can cause things in different directions, miscommunications. People will say, oh, you didn't stick up for that person. I'm leaving the group, or all these other things. You know, If you just do it in public, you just say, hey, you're not, you know, we don't allow these things in our community, and if you're going to continue to do this, we're going to remove you from the mail. Just make it a public mail. Just send it to everyone. It'll, it will dampen the effect. If you just send a personal email to someone, they'll just, they can be just as mean to you back in that personal email, right? It's, it's not as much in the public record. But if you email the 100 person mailing list and you say, hey, we don't, we actually, that's not okay, we don't like that. And if that person then responds to the whole mailing list again and is, you know, very angry and mean, then you just, you remove them, you know? And, and then everyone knows, oh, that, that guy got removed because he was really mean and, and we know why, it's, it's there, you know? So, um, that is hard, and, and sometimes you might need help, and that's okay. Uh, if you don't want to be the person to enforce it publicly, ask someone else, hey, like, I know that you're you know, rough and tumble, and you don't care about yelling people on mailing lists. Like, can you just tell this guy, like, totally not cool, you know? And, and do something like that. That's totally a good <clears throat> avenue of attack as well. All right, any questions about that stuff? Also, this is a lichen, which is a symbiotic organism with many communities and things living together. That's why it's there. All right. Five minutes. Sweet. <laughs> Stay sustainable. So one thing, some of my failures were I got burnt out, I got full-time jobs, I got married, I moved. All kinds of things happened. And because I was a single point of failure, I was the only one doing everything. Whenever something happened in my life that made me busy, there wasn't a meeting, or the group suffered, or you know, just there. There wasn't as much activity as I would like, and you know, to have a, a you know, a live user group just keep going forward. So, rotating leadership, I think, is is really cool. It's really a good idea. So, what I mean by that is, I think there's two different flavors of that, and you can have, you know, for instance, if you have three leaders, and they each take one quarter of the year, like they each take three months of the year, right? That means that the other three leaders, they can go on vacation, they can start a family, they can start a new job in the first six months of a new job, you're not doing anything else but, but being that job. So the rotating leadership makes your user group sustainable. If you can <coughs> prevent that one person burning out, the whole user group goes away, okay? So you're removing a single point of failure. <coughs> Another way to do this is just to have three leaders all the time. They show up to all the meetings, and if even if two of them just don't show up, you still got one leader all the time. So it's, that's more redundancy. Uh, the first method 
is uh, it relies on one person more for each time interval, and the second method relies on them all the time, but in a lesser amount. Like maybe one leader can deal with the venue stuff, another leader deals with the mailing list, so you can kind of split up things like that. That is really important for sustainability. One person can run a user group themselves for three, six months, a year, but then, you know, over the years, like people change, they want to move, and the user group should still be there, it's useful. So, you know, that's a way that you can have to keep going. Another thing is, some, you know, sometimes it's just like, oh, what's, what are we gonna have to talk next week? I don't have any ideas for who to invite or whatever. And you can have like projects that you guys hack on and have some focus and just say like, okay, like for the next three meetings, like let's all work on this thing. Or even, you know, you can have, you know, let's everyone work on you know, a few different projects. But having some focus where there's multiple meetings that are about the same topic where you kind of come back and do something, that helps there be this flow to the future because it's like, oh, I want to come next time and see what has happened or what people have added and modified. So it gives you a little bit of forward oomph. Um, and then another just meta things, mix things up. Don't have the exact same format every time. Don't do this exact same thing at every meeting. Just make one meeting totally different. Like, hey, let's just all hang out. We don't need a presentation. Let's just come here. And then another time, just have 10 lightning talks instead of one long talk, you know, and just mix it up. And, and that and it helps with uh, preventing boredom, I would say. <clears throat> um, and this goes in there. So you kind of do the one long talk thing, which that puts all the, you know, puts all the work onto one person. And if you can't find that one person, you don't have anyone. So uh, lots of small talks is the, is the opposite spectrum. I find that like two or three reasonable small size talks works well, but you have, you have to find two or three people for each meeting. So um, all these things have plus and minuses. You can also do kind of like a co-hacking hackathon meeting like that, or you can make it a purely social meeting. You say, we're going to hang out. There's no itinerary. There's no topic. There's no presentation. We're just all going to nerd out about getting in the same room. Maybe there's drinks involved or something, but just, yeah, the world is your oyster. <clears throat> um, so here's the checklist, up and going in 10 minutes. GitHub.com slash pdxgit slash all that junk. You can fork that repo. That is a GitHub Pages repo. And this is what powers pdxgit.com. Okay, so if you fork that repo on GitHub, then you rename it to what your organization name is, okay? Then you update the links in there, and you can actually use this regex if you want in BIM. I'll show you how. Um, I did do a little rickroll at the bottom. Ooh. Ooh. It's okay. So that's what you get for rickrolling. I know I rickroll. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that whole slide is how to start your user group. That you get, you get a web page, GitHub pages, Twitter bootstrap. You get all of that just in a few minutes. Okay, and you have your website going. <clears throat> You can also register a domain name, and these details, not so important, you know. You can create Facebook and LinkedIn pages. Probably a mailing list is good. Um, random tips, don't try to do everything. Try to have rotating leadership. Have someone that helps in one aspect, so you're not doing everything aligned with conferences. If there's a conference in town, move your meeting so that it's the weekend of the conference, or right before, right after, you'll get a whole bunch of people in your meeting. It's a good friggin' tactic. Make sure you're having fun as well. Um, also, these people, I couldn't have done anything this, this stuff with. Ben made the website pretty, I did not. Bart Massey made the awesome logo. And these guys have also done a huge amount of help in note taking and just giving presentations. Good stuff like that. Um, this is Egal Koshboy, one of my good friends. He's not with us anymore. And this talk is dedicated to him because without him, I wouldn't have started the PDX Get User Group. He really pushed me forward. And so I just wanted to make sure you guys know who he is. And this is me. Get merged social, <coughs> Twitter, website, email, all that junk. Lido Labs is my company. I, I do Git version control consulting. So if your board or your company needs some help with that stuff, come find me. And that's it. Mahalo, thanks. Oh, okay, yeah. Maybe. Questions. Oh no, this guy started a user group. I just met him and he started one. <laughs> I put a link to your website.
WantPDXGIF.com, but I still need to <laughs> do stuff. Did you have a question? No. Just wait. Just, just wait. <laughs> okay. So in case none of you knew, there is a Singapore Git user group. This dude right here runs it. It's called SG Grumpy Gits. It's on Facebook. I'm sure you guys can find it. So you do have a local Git user group. And please come talk to me if you, if this is not enough to help you start your group, come talk to me, email me, tweet at me. I will help you start your Git user group. So just, I'm your resource. If you want it to be, it can happen. Just ask me, ask other people in your community, and it'll happen. Have you had anyone else uh, so far make use of your framework, or just a little new? Well, it's been a, it's a, the framework's been there for a few years. I think people have used it for other user groups, because really all these things apply to other user groups. So even the GitHub pages, you can fork and create a KDE user group with it or something like that. So it's not specific to that. And I think maybe some people, some non git user groups have used it. Um, but yeah, it's not been widely thousands of people forking you know, popularity on GitHub or anything. That's cool. I like, I like that. Yeah, so, yeah, come find me. I'll be here. And I'm, I'm in town until the 18th. So I'll be here for after the conference as well if you guys have more time after the conference. Bye-bye.